Do you have some sort of trailer with electric brakes and you need to replace the brakes? Could be a utility trailer, maybe a camper trailer, horse trailer, whatever it is. If it's got electric brakes, you can replace them. It's really not at all as hard as you might think. I'm going to show you how to do it. What's going on guys? Welcome to this episode of Home Built Workshop. I hope you're all having a great day. Today it's going to be kind of fun. We're going to be getting greasy and replacing some electric trailer brakes. Sorry about the sunglasses, but it's really bright out here. Otherwise I'd be squinting like crazy. I don't know which one's worse. Let me know down below. Now I don't know about you, but I've never been a fan of doing drum brakes on a vehicle. So I wasn't super excited about replacing drum brakes on a trailer, but turns out this is a lot easier than I originally expected. We're gonna walk through the process. I'm gonna show you how to get it done. The wind, what's up with that? <laughs> it's fall here in Colorado. Now this may seem obvious, but the first thing you wanna do is lift the vehicle up. Now for this particular trailer, we have one of those drive on little lift blocks that lifts the other axle off the ground. It works really slick and a great quick option for lifting up a tire, especially if you got to do it alongside the road. But whether you use a floor jack or whatever you have, we'll get the tire up, we'll pull these lug nuts off, and I'll show you how quick this is going to go. There's a little spider that came out to say hi. Sorry, little guy. Before I pull this drum off, I'm just going to spin it just to really see if it's making any weird noise and I don't hear any brake drag or anything, which kind of leads me to believe that, well, maybe these brakes aren't even working. We need to remove this dust cap so that we can get to the nut that's underneath it and pull the whole drum off. Here I'm just using a scraper to clean the dirt out of the edge and start working the cap loose. Ugh, greasy, gunky goodness. Now it's probably in your best interest to grab a bunch of rags or maybe even some gloves. I'm gonna wipe this out just a little bit. Look at that gunky goop. Underneath all this grime for this particular axle, there's a retaining clip. Sometimes you'll have a castle nut with a cotter pin, but this little retaining clip clips onto the nut and holds everything in place. Don't lose it. And likely you be able to just pull it off with your fingers or maybe you have a screwdriver to gently pull it loose, but don't damage it. You're going to need to replace this. Then we have an axle nut here, which really shouldn't be any more than hand tight. You can see I didn't put anything on there and we can just unscrew it. These don't need a whole lot of pressure when you put it back together either. We're not going to crank it down really just finger tight. I'm going to pull out this washer. This one in particular has the bearing stuck to the back. That's okay. You are going to get dirty at this. And now the drum will just pull right off. And there's our drum. Now with the hub off, I'm just kind of taking a quick look at these just to see what's going on here. And I look at these pads and there's dirt coming off on my fingers from the pads. They're not shined up or anything, which tells me that these things really aren't even functioning. Now, it could be because the unit is malfunctioned or maybe it just needs adjusted. But nonetheless, it's going to work much better once we replace all these. And if I look inside the drum, I can see the surface all along this edge here. It's not shiny either. There's just a tiny little spot where it's shined up. So really these things weren't doing a whole lot of anything. Before I tear this apart the rest of the way, I just want to show you really quick how these work. Down here we have an electromagnet, which when you step on your brake pedal, it's connected through the brake controller for the trailer. That energizes this electromagnet, depending on the setting of your brake controller. If you have it set higher, it's going to exert more force or if it's set lower, it's going to be less force, but this is going to suck to the inside of the drum, this portion right here. And then as the wheel spins, that rotation causes these pads to expand out, which presses 
along the outer area of the drum, and that's where you get your braking force from. Before I move any farther, I'm just going to take a rag and try to get some of this initial grease and grime off of this spindle. We got to make sure this is nice and clean when we put it back together. Now this time, the seal on the back of the drum stayed attached to the drum. A lot of times that seal can come loose and there might be a seal packed full of grease in here. You'd have to remove that too. In this case, the seal is going to be right here. Now at this stage here, if we were doing this on an old pickup or something like that that had drum brakes, this is the step where you'd have to go get your brake tools and you'd pull off these little round retainers and you'd be pulling springs off and trying to remember how everything goes back together. But this is where trailer brakes are much different and in my opinion, a whole lot easier than doing this on a vehicle. Now we're just going to pull this entire backing plate off and basically throw it in the weeds and bolt on a new one. It's pretty slick. Now we'll just remove the five bolts for this particular axle and remove the entire backing plate. Oh, and I was only kidding. Don't throw your backing plate in the weeds. Please dispose of it properly. There's just a nut and washer. You want to keep track of these because we're going to need to reuse them. And now we'll just grab a pair of wire cutters and cut the wires that run to the electromagnet. Yes, it's that easy. A little bit scary cutting the wires, which when I pulled this one off, I realized that these wires are already cut. So no wonder they're not working. I like to leave as much length as I can. We'll shorten them up a little later on, but that way I have plenty of cable length to get everything routed nice and neat. Kind of weird. These ones had broken right there. So we're gonna have to splice into those, but not a big deal. Just pull the old unit off and we're almost ready to start reassembling this. I'm gonna finish cleaning up all of these parts. I'll wipe off as much grease as I can. Then we'll use a wire brush and just try to get everything as clean as possible. Then we'll wipe it down again before reassembling it. We don't want to have any dirt in here on these bearing surfaces. Any contaminants that get in there can cause to early bearing wear. Well, we don't want that. Here I'm just using a small wire brush just to remove any rough, rusty material. It's important to know I'm not using the wire brush on any of the polished bearing surfaces, only on the rusty bits where the new backing plate's gonna go. I just wanna make sure that there's nothing that's going to interfere with the fit of the new plate. And another quick wipe down of the spindle to make sure there's no rust particles stuck on there. Now this step is optional. If you don't prefer to use it, you don't need to, but I'm gonna put just a tiny bit of anti-seize on these bolts. They came off a little bit harder than I expected, so I wanna to try to protect these bolts and keep them from seizing up later on. And now for the best part. There's our new brakes. Now I'll just reinstall the washers and the nuts that we removed earlier. I'm not going to tighten these down completely just yet. I want to leave them a little bit loose in case we need to wiggle things around. See, I told you it was easy. Now, of course, we're not done yet. We still got to repack the bearings and get everything reassembled. But really, unbolt the old backing plate, bolt on the whole new backing plate with the brakes and everything. So much easier than wrestling with these silly springs and retainers and all that stuff like you would do on a vehicle drum brakes. I wonder why the car manufacturers never went to a design like this. This just seems so easy, obviously minus the electromagnet, but man, it just, they would have saved so much time back in the day. Now, if you're asking, well, what kind of brakes do I need to get for my trailer? Well, there's a couple things that you need to know about your axle before you can go and order up these kits. Now, this particular trailer is a horse trailer these are Dexter axles. Dexter's one of the more popular brands of trailer axles. There's a couple other ones. What is it? Elko, I think, makes trailer axles and maybe a couple of others. This one has some branding on the hubs that specifically say Dexter. So I know right away that this is a Dexter axle. The other dimension that you need to know is the width of your pad as well as the diameter of your drum. 
Now these are a two inch wide pad. To get the size of your drum, you just measure across here. And these are a 12 inch drum and a two inch pad. So these are a 12 by two. They also have a five bolt backing plate. A lot of lighter duty axles, utility trailers, and that sort of thing will have a four bolt. So there's different styles and those are based on the weight limits of the axle. But knowing that it's a 12 by two and a Dexter axle, we were able to go to our local trailer supply shop and they were able to get the correct ones. One other important thing is that these are directional by the side. So if you're working on the left side, you need to have the backing plates for left. The other side will say right. And that's because the way the wheel rotates, these are oriented differently from side to side. With the new backing plate on, we're ready to reconnect our wires before moving on to the bearings. But there's one little piece, I'm gonna crawl under this trailer and try to show you that you gotta keep an eye out for. It's really not a big deal, but I learned this from experience. Now this probably would have been easier to show you before I put the backing plate on, but I feel like this gives a better demonstration. On the back of these backing plates, well, there's a little bit of a tongue twister. There's this little plastic tab and that is meant to hold the wires once we get everything connected. This little tab will eventually snap back into this hole and hold everything securely. The very first time I ever did a job like this, I didn't really pay attention to the location of this tab and ended up bolting it in place behind the mounting stud here. So it didn't allow the backing plate to seat correctly. Plus I couldn't get this thing out to snap it to the wire. So when you're putting the backing plate on, make sure that this thing is out of the way and also that your wires are clear so that you don't pinch it when you bolt everything back in place. Now all I need to do is to connect these two wires to the two wires that were conveniently broken. I don't know if you can see those. You could use a crimp style connector, but if you're gonna do that, I would highly recommend using a crimp style connector that also has the built-in heat shield and that's weather rated. You want this to be a good solid connection. If you can avoid it, please avoid using just wire nuts or something like that. I mean, it'll get you by in a pinch, but I definitely don't recommend it. To make my connections, I don't have any of the heat shrink butt connectors. I'm gonna take these, strip them back, and solder these connections together and then use some heat shrink tubing to make sure everything's good and solid. Soldering makes a super good connection. It takes a little bit extra work, takes a little extra time, but in the end, I feel that it's worth it. We wanna do a good job when we're doing this thing. We are talking about brakes here. Now I'll carefully twist the wires together as tight as I can get them while trying to keep the ball of wire as flat as possible. That'll allow the heat shrink tubing to slip in place easier. Here's a pro tip for you. If you don't plug your soldering iron in, it doesn't heat up. <laughs> That's better. I guess that's an excuse to get one of those fancy cordless jobs. Before soldering, make sure you have your heat shrink tubing already on the wire. I already slipped mine on and got it well out of the way of where I'm going to be working. Now if you use heat shrink, it's important to let the wire cool before you try to slide that up there. Otherwise, if you try to slide the heat shrink up onto the hot solder joint, it will melt the end of your heat shrink and you'll never get the heat shrink to slide any farther. Ask me how I found that out. <laughs> Pro tip. But we're just full of tips this time. I'm just using a regular heat gun on the shrink wrap, again because I don't have one of those cordless deals. Heat shrink complete. And we'll just loop that wire through that little plastic thing. And this thing can be a little tricky to shove into place. There we go. Sometimes it's hard to press with your finger, so I just use a screwdriver or really whatever you have. Hey, the sun's kind of moved behind a tree, so I'm not squinting at you. Now we've got the backing plate installed, the brakes are connected, the electromagnet, which activates the brakes. Now we're ready to focus on getting the bearings packed and the hub installed. So here's our new wheel hub. We're not gonna reuse the old one. 
The surface is fairly grooved up. Now I believe these can be turned down to some extent, but really it's just easier, I think, to just unfortunately spend the extra money and replace the hubs. That way all the surfaces are nice and smooth and you don't have to worry about trying to have things machined. We've got new bearings. We're gonna repack those as well as a new seal. Now the seal is important because it keeps the grease inside there. This seal goes in here, but we can't install that yet until we have the rear bearing packed with grease because that needs to go in there first, then the seal gets installed. Then we can put this on the spindle and then install the front bearing. So I guess it's time to get some rubber gloves and pack some bearings. Now let's say you were going to reuse your old bearings. Well, the first thing you would need to do is to clean these out so that they look pretty much like a brand new bearing. This can be kind of tricky to do, especially if you don't have a parts washer. Of course, if you have a parts washer, throw these in the parts washer, clean them up really good, rinse them off, blow them out with some compressed air, and you're pretty much good to repack them. But if you don't have a parts washer, like I don't, but if I was going to reuse those old bearings, I would probably get some kerosene or diesel fuel, or I guess even gasoline would probably work, and soak these in some sort of container with the diesel fuel or whatever, and that'll start to soften the grease. Then you can go in and kind of just wipe them off, maybe use a soft brush and try to clean them as best you could, and then blast them out with some compressed air. Maybe have to repeat that a couple times until you get them cleaned. That's how I would do it if I was going to reuse the old bearings. When you pack the bearings, what we're doing is forcing the grease into the bearing, and that's really important because you don't want to have any areas not covered with the grease. So I don't know about you, but I can remember helping my grandpa pack bearings for, I don't know what it was, maybe the old tractor or something that he always had. And really there's something kind of fun about it. You just get in there, you get all gooey and greasy, work that grease in there. I'll show you how to do it. First we'll just grab a glob of grease and smear it around on the inside of the bearing race. Then I'll grab another heap of grease and put it in my palm. Once we have a good glob in there, I'm just going to take the edge of my palm and kind of just start scooping that grease down into the edge. Now there's fancy bearing packers and stuff you can get for this, but that's another gadget that, well, I don't have. So we're doing it the old school way. We're going to work our way all the way around the bearing on one side, then we'll flip the bearing over and pack more grease in the other side. Once I get one side all filled, I'll grab another blob of grease and we'll do the other side. I don't know if it's just because I'm maybe a little old school or what, but I like to add a little extra grease to the outside as well. Then we can set this down inside the race. We might as well pack the outer bearing while we're all greased up. Now we can take the seal. I like to put a little bit of grease around that rubber portion. just so everything's nice and lubricated. Set that in place. Grab your fancy seal driver, or in my case, just a big heavy flat plate of steel. Now we're ready to put this on the spindle. And once again, it's more grease. This time I'm smearing it all over on the spindle. There's one thing I want to show you before I put that hub on there. Down here is the adjuster. We're going to need to get in there and manipulate this with a screwdriver later. It's going to be really hard to show you this after the fact because it's going to be covered and I need to go in through the back. There's an access port. I don't know if you can see it right here. 
It allows you to get up in here and spin this adjuster wheel with a flathead screwdriver or the proper brake tool, but a screwdriver works fine. You'll be able to turn this to expand or loosen the brakes. That way we can adjust them so that we have a teeny, teeny bit of drag later on. I forget which direction it is at the moment, but we'll figure that out when we go to adjust it. You turn it one way to bring the pads in and the other way to bring the pads out. When we're setting it, we want to turn it out until we have just a tiny bit of drag and then we'll back it off just a little bit. We want these pads to be close to the drum, but not dragging on the drum, creating excess wear and heat. So the adjuster is right here. We'll, we'll get to that through the back later. Be careful when sliding the hub back on. You don't want to damage that brand new seal we just installed. More grease. This time it's for the outer bearing race. Then we can put our freshly packed bearing in, followed by the washer. This washer can only go on one way. You can see there's a little flat on there that references a flat in the end of the spindle. I cleaned the washer and the nut off as best I could with a rag. To tighten this down, remember when we took it off, it was finger tight. To make sure everything's seated, I'll just use a pair of channel locks, tighten it down until it stops. I'll give it a couple spins, loosen it up again, kind of nudge it in there. I just kind of work it back and forth a couple times just to make sure that the bearings are all seated fully in their race. And then we can just go finger tight. Now at this point, if your axle uses a castle nut and a cotter pin, you can install the cotter pin, bend it over. But remember this one has that little clip. This has a little notch, which also references the flat on the spindle. So we'll just line that up. There we go. And lastly, our center cap. This one in particular has a little rubber grommet that you pull off so you can grease the grease fittings in here. This one is actually torn, so I'm gonna to have to get a replacement for that. Now the last thing we need to do is to climb back underneath and through that little access port, adjust that little star wheel so that we have just a little bit of tension on the brake pads and then we'll back it off just a little bit. Right now, I don't hear any dragging or anything. We're gonna adjust it so that we hear a little bit of drag and then we'll back it off a notch or two so that the pads are as close as they can be to the hub without dragging. I'm going in. Don't hit your head on that thing right there. That hurts. <laughs> Found that out the hard way. Oh, ow, ow, Ugh, this is awkward. To adjust the pads out, I'm rotating the star wheel up, if that makes sense. For this side of the trailer, I'm rotating them counterclockwise. Now on the other side, that's probably gonna end up being clockwise, still rotating the star wheel up to expand the initial setting on the brake pads. To loosen the brake pads, I'll rotate the star wheel down. I got just a little bit of drag. I'm gonna back that off a click. There we go. There's just the teensiest bit of drag on there right now. Only in one little spot. So that'll wear in pretty quick. I'm gonna leave it right there. If you could hear the brakes dragging the whole time you're rotating it, it's probably a little bit tight and you might back it off just a little bit. I think this is good to go. Now we can test it out. Well, that wraps up our brake change for our trailer axles. Well, 
for one axle anyway. I got three more tires to do. See, I told you it wasn't gonna be hard. Way easier than doing it on the old vehicles where it took forever, and then you forgot how they went together. Just figure out what axles you have, order the appropriate sizes, bolt that sucker on, wire it up, and well, you're pretty much done. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, I'd love to have you on as a subscriber. Just hit that subscribe button. You know you want to, it's free. It doesn't cost a thing, just hit it. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate all of you. Till next time, thanks a lot for watching. Uh -huh.